Good morning and welcome to the 24th meeting uh, in 2014 of the Health and Sport Committee. And that usual at this point, I could ask everyone in the room to switch off mobile phones and other wireless devices in order to minimise any potential uh, disruption. But um, I should also uh, draw attention to um, officials and members of the public that uh, there are uh, um, officials and members using tablet devices uh, instead of their hard copies of their papers this morning. Uh, first item on the agenda today is a decision to take um, item three in private, which is a uh, consideration of our work programme. Can I have the committee's agreement that we take item three in private? Thank, Thank you. you. Item two, um, uh, which we now move to, is um, uh, uh, stage one scrutiny of the Mental Health Scotland Bill. And this morning we have one panel of witnesses, um, Dr Joe Morrow, President, Mental Health Tribunal for Scotland, welcome. Uh, and Mr Colin Mackay, Chief Executive, Mental Welfare Commission for Scotland, welcome to you both. Um, uh, you know, I, uh, just to, to help us, I mean, I offer uh, one or both of you to make some introductory remarks and then we would move directly to questions from the committee, if that's okay. Uh, there you go. <laughs> right, Toss a coin. I'll, 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 I'll take off. Um, uh, yes, I haven't really prepared anything, but uh, generally I think, uh, as was to say something about the bill. First of all, thank you very much uh, for uh, inviting us to um, give evidence on this. Um, the, the tribunal, just to be clear, is the body which um, authorises and uh, makes decisions on measures of compulsion under the bill. The commission is uh, a statutory body which, I mean, we don't make decisions on detention, so uh, Dr Morrow will be much better placed to tell you about the detail of how some of the processes of uh, compulsory treatment operate uh, in practice, but we do uh, monitor the operation of the Act and we may hopefully have some information we can give you about how the Act uh, is working. The Commission also visits people who are subject to uh, compulsion under the Act. Uh, where we have concerns about people's welfare, we uh, investigate that and we also publish um, guidance and advice uh, on uh, the operation of the Act and, and particularly around ensuring that the Act properly, the operation of the Act properly balances the, um, the ethical and medical and legal uh, issues that need to be taken into account when making decisions about uh, care and treatment. And we have a particular responsibility for ensuring that the Millen <coughs> principles are uh, promoted and upheld in, in the operation of the Act. Um, if you'd like to briefly comment on, on the Bill, I think our Gen the Commission's general take on this is that, that this is, um, as I think the government have been clear, a relatively modest bill, and, and I think it's, it's a helpful bill um, uh, so far as it goes, and it's got a number of uh, provisions in it which will um, improve the efficiency and operation of uh, mental health legislation. I think one or two things we'd want to say more generally. Um, First of all, the, the Millen Report was um, a visionary report, um, but it was also a very carefully balanced report between um, the protection of uh, people who are subject to compulsory treatment and an important principle that uh, we need to ensure that uh, people don't have to be detained or sectioned in order to get the, the care and treatment that they require. That was something that greatly exercised Millen, that we, we can't have a situation where um, in order to get a kind of gold standard of care or even an acceptable standard of care, doctors have to uh, force you to be detained. So um, there are important aspects of the Millen um, report and the 2003 Act about voluntary care, particularly the duties on local authorities in sections 25 to 27 uh, and the duties to promote advocacy. Uh, and one of the concerns that we have um, is that um, those duties are actually quite quite strong and quite powerful duties and were very much part of the, the scheme of the Act. Uh, and we do have concerns about whether or not those um, duties are being fully fulfilled in practice. And I think some of the other evidence that the committee has received, um, we tend to support that, that there is a general anxiety that some of the aspirations of the 2003 legislation are, uh, are not being fully met. We'd also recognise, though, that local authorities are under very great pressure and that... Um, mental health officers uh, in particular 
are under pressure, both from the increasing use of this Act and from the use of the Adults with Incapacity Act. Um, and while we don't have any huge kind of, uh, as it were, principal concerns about the way in which the, the Act increases the duties on, on MHOs, we do have real concerns that, that unless the government uh, invests in um, some kind of strategic review of the provision of MHOs, that it's not going to be possible for the, the protections in the Act to work effectively. And it's important to remember in that context that um, I think 44% of um, compulsory treatment orders are now in the community, so the role of local authorities is uh, increasingly important. Um, in relation to what's in the in the bill, as I say, we generally think it's 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 good and helpful. I think the concerns that we have, where we have concerns, are where there, there's a number of areas where timescales are being extended, and we, we're sometimes not entirely sure of the justification of that in terms of timescales for statutory bodies to do certain things, whereas um, some of the timescales in relation to patients and the, their rights are being uh, contracted, and, and we'd hope that the committee would, uh, would examine very closely um, those provisions. Um, we do think there's been quite a long delay in sorting out issues around excessive security, and uh, the bill seems to be... Um, as it were, taking a step back and saying, let's start again and try and get it right this time, which, which may be technically correct, but I think we, we'd be looking to see some, some clarity and some clear time skills on um, improving the appeal rights in relation to uh, excessive security. And in some of the areas, um, I think it's important to see the, the bill where it delivers re McManus recommendations in the context of the wider implementation of McManus. So I think I would point to advanced statements, for example, there is a modest and perfectly sensible provision in the bill to um, create a register of advanced statements in the hope that that will help to promote the use of advanced statements. We strongly believe that there should be a much greater use of advanced statements, but it's not going to happen just by uh, that measure. It needs to be something where th there's really a concerted effort to look at what the barriers are, why people don't use advanced statements, and helping service users to, um, to use them, and generally to advance the extent to which service users um, have increasing control and uh, ability to negotiate and be, participate in decisions about them, even where they may have uh, an impaired level of capacity or understanding. Thank you. Dalton Morrow. Uh, Kavira, if you, if you want me to give an opening statement, I can, but I'm really very keen that, in fact, we get questions from the committee that might be of interest to them. But, but in a very short opening statement, I, I would say that the tribunal is there primarily to administer the justice within this particular uh, arena. The second thing I'd want to say is that throughout my presidency of the tribunal, the focus has been on the patient uh, and actually the patient's participation. And these are often what are referred to as the Millen uh, pr principles. Uh, as for the bill itself, uh, in general terms, we think it's, I think it's a good thing. Uh, it, it, it states out in the policy objectives that it's there to improve efficiency and effectiveness of the mental health system in Scotland, and I think it will assist uh, in, in some of the amendments that are before us uh, in actually making that legislative framework much more um, efficient and effective, and hence much more focused to assist the patient in that process. Uh, secondly, I think there's some mi minor technical amendments going on that are, that are well overdue for those of us who get ourselves into a, a chair where we have to deal with technical issues around legislation. So that will be welcomed. Uh, the other thing that, that I welcome uh, greatly is the creation of the Victims Notification Scheme. Um, uh, as President, I have to sit on a large number of compulsion and restriction order cases of which there are often victims uh, involved in them. Uh, and, and actually to see the process of victims before the tribunal and its effectiveness is something that, that, that actually has been quite moving for me, but also very significant in providing a humane system of, of mental health law. Uh, and as such, the creation of the scheme is something I great, greatly welcome. Uh, the, the only uh, uh, thing I would want to do by way of, of explanation is, is for the committee, and I'm sure they do understand, the, 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 is the issue about our, uh, our support for the extension of five to ten days uh, in terms of the period between a short-term detention and, and a hearing. And I know there's developed a number of views concerning this, and it arose initially out of the number of duplicate hearings, you know, the number of hearings it took to get a, a decision resolved. 
I've worked away at that, and that's now eradicated as a, as a real serious issue for the tribunal. But the tribunal's support of the 10-day period is to allow the patient and the named person more time to, to prepare. So that's where we're coming from there. Often a patient will receive an application for a compulsory treatment order at the end of a short-term detention, uh, and they have five days to instruct uh, a solicitor to get an advocate put in place and arrive at the hearing. In many cases, um, by the time the named person, who's a very significant um, protection within the system, is engaged, it's day three, uh, and, and we find that often hearings are going off um, for, to allow a, a preparation for the patient and named person. So that's really where we're coming for, from on that, on that issue. Uh, I will continue to work to improve the, the, double, the, the number of multiple hearings, and I think at one stage we were down to only 20% went to a second hearing, and there was a variety of reasons uh, for that. But I do think that there's, there's evidence now available to us to suggest that that wee bit of time will allow a more mature thought with the patient, uh, instructing solicitors, instructing advocates, and also the obtaining of the, 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 pa the patient's name person's involvement in it. So that's where we're coming from uh, in there. And there was suggestions that there was no need for it uh, made to me uh, because the tribunal had done a good job at getting the number of multiple hearings down. Uh, that's not where I'm coming from on that. That's a separate issue altogether. The efficiency and effectiveness of the administration of justice within the tribunal is something that I'm committed to and will continue to actually progress uh, as part of the improvement mode of the tribunal focused on the patient. Uh, but the issue of the, of, the, of the 10 days is really to help us further focus on the patient's involvement. Uh, I think you need to bear in mind what's going on at this time as well, that the patient uh, is... is until through the tribunal mentally disordered. So it's quite a stressful situation to come to a tribunal. It's also stressful for a patient's carer or named person to come along. And, and that wee bit time for consideration is really what this is all about now in terms of us um, supporting it. But as I've said on regular occasions, I'm in, I'm in your hands on this matter. It's not, but it's not to do with the efficiency of the tribunal. It's to do with the the provision of, uh, of actual time for, for, for the patient. But in general terms, that's where we are with regard to the, to the, to the, um, to, to the, to the actual bill itself. I, I mean, it's probably, in a, I, I, I never know what to say about these things, but uh, it's probably time that we had this kind of tidy up with regard to the, to, to the Act, because there's lots of practice that's gone out there and lots of development under the, the, the 2003 Act that now requires this kind of level of of actually focusing and tidying up. So that's why I welcome it. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you both for that. Uh, we go directly to questions. Richard Simpson. Can I just ask a very specific question then, a general one, or would you rather have stuck to the general one at this point? Yeah, just proceed, Richard. Yeah. Well, just to cl clarify the issue that Dr Morrow raised, do you feel that the Act, as it's now proposed, actually gives that power to the named person, carer, or independent advocate to seek an extension to 10 days, or who is it that will be able to seek that extension? Is it the tribunal, the RMO? You know, because on the principles you've laid out, I really am much more comfortable, but I want it to be clear in the Act that it is for the named person or carer or um, independent advocate to say, I need more time. I mean, in reality, what, is that all right for me to speak? Yes. The answer, I don't know, I mean, to, 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 to answer that directly. The, 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 in reality, the 10 day period will be there in law. So that will allow us to have that period um, to, to actually get all of that stuff put into place that you're talk, talking about. In practice, I would intend to, to actually intimate the hearing as soon as practically possible. So, uh, and that, would, that just involves a wee bit of work with the patient, with the patient's advocate and with the named person so that we're not just a day short to getting everybody lined up and then having to put it off for another period. I also welcome, in terms of the, 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 the bill, the, the idea that this could come off any other period of detention. I have no desire for a patient to be, to be detained any longer than necessary, and there are suggestions that it could come off the overall period of detention or off the period of any interim. The difficulty that we have now with the legislation is that if we have to put a hearing off, then it's, we're allowed to put the hearing off for up to 56 days over two periods. So these are called interim orders. 
uh, and that, that radically can extend the period of, 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 uh, of detention um, simply because we're not at a stage of preparedness uh, in relation to the named person or to the, to, the, to the patient. Your anticipation would be that if we do get this right, that the uh, use of interim orders in order to just take the thing forward would actually be reduced. That we, you'd get a more definitive result to either detain or not detain. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's back to the kind of an old mantra which, which the, the, in the Ministry of Justice they use is getting it right first time. Uh, it's done in a different setting, but I mean, I think when you're dealing with someone's mental disorder, dealing with the suspension of their, their liberty and dealing with forcible medical treatment which must be at the highest end of any interstate intervention, we need to do it as quickly as possible and, and not to drag it out any longer than necessary. So that would be my views, sir. Richard, what, what, I would like to offer the committee, given we're, all, we're focused on the, the, this issue, uh, so we can move on, and it may be useful. You see, if, if any committee members have got any supplementaries strictly on this issue about the tribunal, are we all satisfied that... It's been explored and we've got good evidence about the motives. Mr Mackay has a comment because the MWC had a, had a bit in their submission about it. Yeah, I mean, um, thank you. Um, yes, we, we, we did take a slightly different view in our response and I, I think um, that was very much on balance. I mean, we do recognise very much and agree with the wish to reduce the number of um, interim hearings and, and repeat hearings because we know that's extremely distressing for the, the patient and for, and for the family and the, the more hearings go on the more likely is they'll disengage from the whole, whole process so um, and we're more persuaded of the argument that um, if this will allow the uh, service user or the patient uh, to prepare uh, and to get uh, legal advice and to get a medical opinion um, in order for the matter to be dealt with on, at the first hearing um, then that's a good thing Against that, I suppose we have a nervousness that this, I say, this 10-day extension is automatic. And although I have great faith in Dr. Morrow and his administration of the tribunal, I mean, in terms of just general practice, obviously there's always a risk that, that when you you, you stretch out um, uh, timescales, that, that people start to work to uh, the new timescales. Um, and these will be a, a, it's effectively an extension for everybody, meaning that you know it's quite a long time before. Um, a decision to detain you and give you forcible, compulsory treatment, potentially forcible treatment, is is reviewed. So we have a nervousness um, about that, and, and I guess what we would like to see, if um, uh, Parliament does decide to, to make this extension, is uh, I suppose some commitment to making sure that the good outcome that we want, which is far fewer um, uh, interim hearings, actually happens, uh, and possibly a provision that, that if that doesn't happen, or it turns out that, that there are other uh, negative consequences that that could be um, scaled back again. I mean, there might be ways in which that could be done to allow uh, the time scale to be reduced by order. But at the moment, as I say, we we, we think, um, I say, we we're not sure the case is yet proved. Uh, I think the committee might want to. I don't know if they're taking evidence from some of the legal um, bodies that have responded, like the Law Society and the LSE. I mean, I think it's interesting that they've said they don't welcome these, although you, you would think if it was to give them more time, they would welcome it. So um, I think it would be interesting to test out what their view is on, on that. I, I should have declared um, my psychiatric connections and my Sam H connections, but the Sam H have proposed a sunset clause, which might satisfy uh, Colin Mackay's the Mental Welfare Commission. If we test it and try it, but have a sunset clause, then that might actually be a, a reasonable way to proceed, because then you would have a review by Parliament. Yeah, I, th I think something like that, which would make sure that, as I say, that the, the things we want to achieve happen and the things that we don't want to achieve don't happen would be helpful. Dr. Morrow, you... I mean, I, I mean, the only thing I would say is there's absolutely no evidence in terms of the tribunal's practice that we've ever been delayed dealing with a case where we could move it forward. So the, the, in terms of extension of the... To the, to the 10 days, I mean, I would, in, uh, I mean, I would, would almost take, give you a commitment that I will work, work extremely hard and focused in making sure that that's delivered for the patient uh, as soon as possible. Uh, and, and if you look at the results of the tribunal in terms of the reduction of multiple hearings or interims or adjournments over the last six-year period, it's been radical. Uh, and I'm committed to that, because it, not because uh, I'm committed to it, for a, some kind of structural reason or legal reason, 
I'm committed to it because it's, it's the best practice I can provide for the patient who's mentally disordered that appears before the tribunal and administering the justice system for it. And all the, the fears and the anxieties that people talk about are not evidenced by our practice within the tribunal at present. Um, so that's what I want to give assurance to, that it's not about um, making it more comfortable for the tribunal. It's about getting it right for the patients in, ter patients in terms of the procedure. And that's why I'm supporting the extension to 10 days. Bob, I think you've got a supplementary on this. Have we got any others on this specific before we move on? Bob, you, you, you've got uh, final yeah. supplementary before we move on. A couple of Lots of kind of very brief little questions. I'm, I'm very sympathetic to the proposals, but there's just one or two things I want to check. For example, <coughs> if someone's on a short-term uh, certificate, um, I'm just wondering, as things currently stand, if, say, after 23 days, as it would be currently, um, whether or not you're talking about a it was an issue, it's currently a five-day extension that, that's permissible. So after 23 days, is it usually pretty clear about whether or not um, you want to apply for um, a, a, another form of order. Um, another the point I'm trying to get to is what is it about 28 days in the first place? So if you want, if someone's going to go to a tribunal f f for a more meaningful extension or, 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 or looking at what this, what this disposal should be, surely after 23 days um, mental health professionals should have a pretty good idea so within the 28 days, if you know after 23 days you've already got that information, and if it's a 10-day extension, in some cases after 18 days, does it become quite clear to some mental health professionals that an extension is going to be required? I'm just trying to get beneath the, the numbers. Why is it 28 days in the first place, I think, would be helpful to, to know. I, mean, I can't answer that, but Colin might be able to in terms of well, that's what's in the Act. It's 28 days. What I can tell you about the practicalities around about it is that between round about day 23 and day 28 is when we start getting the applications in for compulsory treatment orders. Now, that's just as a matter of practice, but it, you can never hold it to every case. Uh, sometimes they come in much earlier, sometimes they come in right at the end of the 28-day the period. When I've attempted to try to make some, find some, some, some reasons for it, um, you know, the, the medical people tell me that it's really about the assessment process, that they require a, you know, a, a, piece of t a piece of time to do a proper medical assessment. And, and, and they've suggested to me, although you couldn't really hold it as a rule if that's what you're looking to, that around about three weeks is necessary to do, to do an initial assessment. And it's in that fourth week, which would be day 21 to 28, that the discussions with the multidisciplinary team are made to whether we continue to, uh, to uh, towards a uh, compulsory treatment order. Um, yes, I, mean, I, I think I would generally reinforce that. And I, I, I should say, obviously, I have a, a like Joe, a legal background rather than a medical background. So you, you, you might want to um, take some some of this from some of the medical people who might be giving evidence to you. But that's my general understanding as well that um, it will vary. Obviously, some people may be in recurrently, and it will become clear much earlier on if you know the patient already what's going on and that their situation is deteriorating, they're going to need a long, longer term stay. But, but often it will take uh, about three weeks or so just to get a sense of um, uh, is this going to be required CTO? And, and very many orders will not go beyond uh, the, the, the short term 28 day order. I should also say, I mean, it's, it's been 28 days. Uh, it was 28 days of the 1984 yeah. Act and then the 1960 Act. So it's, it's a long standing um, period, which I think is deemed enough time to um, uh, to make an assessment. I think what's more challenging now is obviously the tribunal does require a more, a more detailed proposition to be put to it than the old Sheriff Court did back before the 2003 Act. So we recognise that there are quite a lot of pressures on both sides to get this stuff ready at, at, at the end of that 28-day period. Well, that's helpful because we get kind of a bit of agreement between the witnesses that 28 days not plucked out of thin air is based in is practice built up over the years of what, what's needed, that, that's helpful. The other figure that Dr Morrow gave was that 80% uh, of hearings don't lead to a, a, a duplicate or multiple hearing now. That, that was one good month. Uh, but, but in fact, it's, it's in between 8, 20 and 30% each uh, your month go to a second hearing. But the best month we've had is 20%. Right, OK. Um, 
the best one's twenty percent, but it's between twenty to thirty yeah. percent on average, depend, yeah. depending yeah. on good or bad yeah. month, let's yeah. say. So therefore, okay. Um, therefore, in terms of the twenty, th that that uh, seventy to eighty percent that don't require a duplicate hearing, are you content that um, family named persons have got the opportunity? when there isn't a second hearing to, to have their views known. So are you content that when you talk about 80% or 70 to 80% in that case, then you're completely content that families and named persons have had the full opportunity to make their views known with the vast majority of cases? Uh, I wouldn't say I was completely content because, because in fact, I, I don't know the answer to that question because we, we, I mean, I don't hear every case myself personally. But, but what I do know is every process has been put into place uh, that, that's possible to engage with the family and with the named person. Uh, some named persons are automatically appointed because of who they are in relation to the relationship to the patient, but don't really want to be the named person, so they may not engage. Uh, and sometimes the named person doesn't want to have someone, so we go so as a, a dead patient doesn't want a named person. But in those who, what I can tell you from, probably from my own experience, that of the cases that I hear, uh, I, I, mean, I, I mean, I'm content that the families and the named persons who come before me have often had an opportunity to actually engage with the process. I suppose that's the clear thing. They've had the opportunity. You can't force to engage in the process, but they've all had a clear opportunity for that 70 to 80 per cent. Yeah, yeah. I, w I wonder if I might just explain to you, though, that not, is this permissible? Yeah, it, 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 all of our cases are not on short time scales. It's only the compulsory treatment orders at initial stage. Around about 50% of our cases are what are commonly called two-year reviews. And so there's a much longer lead-in to them. Uh, and often people are, are in, a, in a settled position. And, and that allows much more time um, to actually engage with families and, 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 name, and named persons. It also means that there's a much longer time of which professionals may have been working with the, 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 the carers and the named persons. So it's only in these ones that go from short-term detention to compulsory order that we've got this short time scale. It's the only real time scale we have in the Act. Uh, and it, it's that group that we're trying to, to tackle uh, in terms of the extension. And that's the group of patients who are often, and again, I don't like talking generally, but are often most, most unwell. So, so there's, a, there's, a, there's a difficulty there. Okay. That's fine. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Um, Richard Lyle, please. Thank you. Mr McKay, in your opening remarks, you actually touched on the point I wanted to question you on, and I welcome uh, Dr Morrow's uh, viewpoint on, on this also. Section 2 of the bill would insert a new section where into the 2003 Act, which sets out new duties for mental health officers including submitting a, a written report to the tribunal when the tribunal is required to remove, review a determination about compulsory treatment. Uh, your commission, the Mental Health uh, Welfare Commission of Scotland, noted that it would be concerned if large numbers of additional MHO reports were required. Um, the commission also estimates... Uh, can you tell me your estimates regarding the number of additional reports that would be required your concerns about the, the, the workforce and the capacity of MHOs to do these sort of reports and also the viewpoint of the tribunal in regards to that. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, first of all, on, on our concerns, I mean, in principle, you know, we'd love mental health officers' reports all the time, but the reality is that the, the, they have other things to do and there are other very important duties that the mental health officers or social workers have to do and, and sometimes we have to balance the, the, require, the, the wish for... MHO uh, involvement with the kind of practicalities um, of that. Um, we, our difficulty in finding the figures is that we um, we can't quite reconcile what's in the, the policy memorandum with what's in the bill because it, it, the, the suggestion that um, uh, there would only be a few reports seemed to be if there were if it was particularly cases where the MHO disagreed with the RMO and I think in those cases we would very much agree that the MHO should actually be saying well why do I disagree with, with the RMO and those would be a very small number of cases. Um, I think it's the two year review cases which the bill seems to suggest um, would be um, also require an MHO report where again as in principle we would have no problem with that but I think we're 
we think it's of the order of about 500 cases a year um, that would involve, and, and as we, we just think that um, is just going to place increasing pressures on uh, MHOs. I mean, if I can say a little bit briefly about what, what those pressures are, a lot of the pressures actually derive not just from the Mental Health Act, but from the Adults with Incapacity Act, and we will be publishing uh, in the next few days our statistics on monitoring of, of the Adults with Incapacity Act, and there's been... Um, a pretty consistent year-on-year -year rise in the use of guardianship applications under the, the Adults with Incapacity Act, and they place duties on mental health officers to prepare reports and to supervise guardians, uh, and, and the numbers are really quite startling, and local authorities um, report now quite long delays in actually preparing reports for private guardianship cases. But in relation to, to this Act, we're also going to publish our statistics in relation to the use of um, this act, I'm just trying to um, find uh, over the next few days, and there have been substantial decrease in the number over time and the number of social circumstances reports prepared, for example, where um, um, uh, a short-term detention is uh, being sought. We don't think there needs to be a social circumstance report in every case, but Glasgow, for example, is now down to only 14% of cases where they prepare um, a social circumstances report. There's also been a 5% fall in the uh, number of cases of emergency detention where an MHO has consented, as, as ideally uh, they should. So I think our worry is to say the system's already started to come apart at the seams a bit. And what we've said is that actually, I mean, it's not so much about the provision of the bill, this is actually about the government looking at the kind of workforce strategy for recruitment and retention of MHOs, they need to get you know, serious about some way of ensuring that there is the degree of MHO cover that is necessary for the, for the act to work effectively. Has there been, Dr Morrow, has there been any, do you know offhand, any tribunals that have not been able to go ahead because reports have not be, been submitted timelessly? You might allow me to say, and I, and I, often, I get teased for saying this uh, by lots of professionals who think that I'm sweeter than I actually I am, um, which is I think the MHOs are the stars of the mental health tribunal system. Uh, we could not work without them. Uh, they're the ones who actually coordinate and make a whole lot of things happen. Uh, and after this committee, I'm going off to speak to MHOs in Pullman uh, College, and I'll be telling them that, and until the day I retire... I'll get up and tell them the stars of the system uh, because they hold it all together. They also are the, 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 they, ha they bring a dimension that's essential for us to understand the context of which we're actually detaining people in. In general terms, if we have no report, we often have the MHO there. So the MHO gives oral evidence before us uh, and, and they, they, they are very, very, very... Um, committed to try to turn up at the tribunals. We have very little non-attendance and it's often holiday or the reasons that any of us would, would, would not attend and they provide uh, reports for, for, the, for the tribunal. Uh, the other thing that they do is that, 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 and this is something that while they do have distinct and independent um, functions uh, uh, in the tribunal, they participate in the multidisciplinary teams. So they've already often contributed to the, to the annual report or, or the annual review or the statement that's come before the tribunal. Um, and, and I think in general terms, from the tribunal's point of view, um, you, we have an effective system and provision from the MHOs. Um, in moving out the tribunal setting and probably uh, bearing in mind that, that, you know, that, is, that we are just a, a, a set up for that judicial purpose, uh, I recognise the pressures that, 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 that Colin Mackay has referred to with regard to the Adults with Incapacity Act and, and the work that, 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 that's done there uh, by, by MHOs. Uh, if I could just add uh, another piece of helpful data that's just been published is the Scottish Social Services workforce data, which has been produced by the um, SSSC. And um, among the statistics it reports, the number of practising MHOs decreased by 3.4% last year. A third of MHOs are 55 or older, so it's, it's an ageing workforce. Um, and the number of MHOs on out-of-hours rota duty is at an all-time low. And that maybe has something to do with some of the issues around emergency detention, because often that will happen 
uh, in the middle of the night or, or whatever, and um, there appear to be difficulties sometimes in accessing MHOs in those kind of cases. Right, and, and, and uh, I'll, I'll give you, uh, I've said this many times before, I actually previously worked with out of our doctor service and had two occasions where we had to wait for a mental health officer to attend. Um, and actually it took, uh, whilst they were on standby, it did take a couple of hours to, to, to come along. Are you, do you feel as though the system of a service is under pressure at this moment? Um, yes, and I think we would, we would say it is under pressure. I mean, uh, it's not that it's um, collapsing, but it is under very uh, severe strain. And I think local authorities are having to balance uh, some strategy duties with very strict time scales with some other things which they would they would like to do, but but often can't. Um, and uh, as they, I think we we think that the whole system needs to be looked. At. I mean, there are. It's not just about money. There are issues about. Um, what training you need to do to be an MHO, how you, you know how you recruit them, how you incentivise people to want to be MHOs. There are quite a lot of those kind of um, meat and potatoes kind of workforce issues which could need, need to be looked at as well to make it um, attractive for social work professionals to, to want to become MHOs and to make sure that they're able to kind of do an effective uh, job uh, when they are uh, in post. To ask one last question, uh, Convener. Do you feel as though we're doing enough to attract people to the profession? The social work profession. Yeah, uh, well, to become an MHO. Um, I, 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 I suspect not. I mean, I think it's, um, I think it's, it's, quite an, uh, it's quite a commitment to choose to become an MHO. I mean, the training requirements are, are quite extensive. Um, it's, it isn't necessarily um, a huge boost in terms of your career or your, or your salary prospects. And, and one concern some local authorities have is if they do invest in MHO recruitment, the MHOs then go and work for another local authority once they're recruited. So just a lot of those kind of very practical uh, issues around uh, making it attractive. And I think at the moment it's it's probably not an attractive enough option. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks, Richard. Um, Rhoda Grant, please. Can I just ask a short sip? Yeah, of course you can. the back of that one first. Um, just as you were talking there about MHOs and the like and the increase in the time that a nurse can detain somebody before an M MHO is present. I'm, I cover the highlands and islands, lots of small islands. I'm wondering if it's sufficient time within the legislation for a nurse to detain if there is a shortage of MHOs. How, how quickly can we physically get someone there? Um, I mean, that's that's uh, a, a tricky one because, again, you're balancing, I suppose, um, two desirable things. One is that the period of the nurse holding a patient um, uh, before a, a decision is made about detention should be as short as possible and on the other hand ideally you'd want both the doctor and the mental health officer there at the moment um, as you'll know the the power is to hold for two hours and then uh, if the doctor arrives within two hours you can detain the uh, person for a further hour while the doctor makes a, an assessment and, and decision the bill proposes that three hours would be the new time limit I and mean, the Commission have said again on balance that we don't um, support that because we think you know this is you know potentially a quite distressing situation for everybody if a nurse is uh, in a sense you know, physically sometimes holding um, uh, a person until uh, a doctor can come and examine them and while we recognize that um, it would be good if more MHOs uh, came out um, I think across the piece we're not sure that just extending the two-hour three limit to three hours is going to make the difference. I think in some cases they were never going to come out anyway because they weren't available um, um, at all. Um, so um, I think on balance, say we wouldn't support um, extending the uh, time limits. And as we said in our evidence, I mean, the, the evidence at the moment is that doctors can attend even in, in remote areas. There doesn't seem to be um, a huge concern that doctors can't make it within the, the two-hour period. We would like MHOs to be able to make it as well, and there may be things that can be done in terms of systems and on-call systems and so on that can help that. But I don't think we would support extending the um, the time period uh, simply in the hope that that will increase the number of MHOs participating in, in, in these cases, because we think the numbers will probably be limited. It's just in a lot of rural remote areas we're now seeing out of hours care being provided by nurses there are no GPs on call at, at any point um, that's happening in Harris um, and many of the other islands as well where a nurse is the person that is there providing out of hours care 
Well, I think the, the nurse's holding power would typically be when people are already um, an inpatient, and, and this is about a person saying, I'm, I'm not staying here, I'm going, and the nurse saying, well, you, you'll have to wait here until a doctor's come to examine you because we think you're, you know, you're not well enough to, to uh, go out on your own. So I think it's a slightly different position from nurses kind of providing kind of care within the community. I'm not sure how often they would use um, the nurse's holding power if that's the kind of situation that you're describing. Okay. Can I move on to um, my main question was about named person. Um, there are concerns about um, reverting back to the 2003 bill if someone hasn't either um, stated their desire not to have a named person or indeed uh, appointed a named person and that's causing concern. Um, there's also concern on behalf of families and carers that they may not be involved because the person uh, doesn't want them to have access to their medical records, which is, you know, a, a fair enough comment. How do we balance all those needs and make sure that we get it right for the patient at the same time? Uh, well, I mean, Dr. Morrow will be able to say much more about how this operates actually in the uh, in in the hearing. But our general position within the commission is that. Um, we're broadly supportive of what McMahon has said, that, that people should choose to have a named person, that it's something that, that carries with it as a significant amount of information will have to be um, passed to that person. Um, uh, and we're about to produce a report on um, uh, the operation of the named person system, which we'll obviously share with the committee when it's published in the next um, few days. And generally, we do find that for a lot of relatives, it is quite a confusing and distressing experience and sometimes the first they hear about this named person role is when a, a bundle of papers kind of comes through the letterbox sometimes as you with very personal and sometimes distressing uh, information in it so I think we've we, we kind of agree that the current system isn't really working and we probably should so far as the named person role is concerned move towards a situation where if the patient wants one they'll have one and we do much more to um, explain to the patient and indeed to the new person what the role involves and how they can participate effectively in the hearing, which goes back again, I suppose, to the importance of the role of the mental health officer in, in actually liaising with uh, the family and indeed the role of advocacy. But I do have to say, although we generally support that, um, we do worry about carers and families, particularly where the person may be so unwell, they're not really able to say what they want or whether they want to appeal or, or whatever. Um, and there are already provisions within the tribunal that, that carers and family members can, can participate in the tribunal, but they don't have the formal rights, for example, to appeal that a named person has. I know that some of the evidence from carers' organisations has suggested that carers should have a right of appeal, particularly if the, patient's, the person's not able to do so themselves, and I think there is something perhaps in that, that if we're going to take away the, the, the named person rule, there might still need to be uh, more done in the legislation to allow carers and family members to step in the shoes of the, uh, the patient where the patient is really too unwell to make those kind of decisions for themselves. I mean, I mean in practice, I mean, it would be it's been fairly well established that as far as the family and carers can be integrated, the overall outcome for a patient within a tribunal setting is, is, is higher if we can get that level of participation. The, the other thing is many of you will remember that un under the old 1984 Act, there was a, a special role for the primary carer. And the name person, in a way, sort of developed that role forward into the 2003 Act. The difficulties that, that have emerged are, are really around the patient having no say in who that named person is if someone can be identified, because it's almost an automatic procedure in law that you work through relatives uh, and they become the named person. So the patient has no say in that. Uh, and also the, 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 the named person may not have any say in that other than to say no to it. So you've got a situation uh, where there may be highly sensitive material that, 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 it's, that, it, that it may or may not be of assistance to share with family members who are named persons, uh, kicking around in a tribunal setting where, where, in fact, we're obliged to serve that material onto the party. Uh, and, and the new provisions uh, allow for a much more proactive engagement by the patient in the choosing of the named person, uh, and also the, the idea that... Um, that, that someone, uh, someone who is going to be a named person has to buy into the process. Now, 
uh, let me just talk personally uh, uh, about this. Um, uh, I, my, my mother had long-term um, mental disorder, and I was her primary carer under the old system. I simply did not want, as a young man, to receive the material I received on that. I didn't want to know that about my mum. I knew that she required care. I, know that she, I knew that she required me to be engaged in the process. But the detail was, was quite... Um, well, I didn't. Even, I mean, I wasn't even experienced enough at that time to understand what that detail me meant as a young twenty-something. Uh, and you can see the role reversed. Uh, if it was a son or a, or a daughter and a mother or a father, the, the son and daughter may not want the mum and dad to know. And, and so, at the moment, there, there's almost a compulsion that that material has to go out. And, and I'm not sure it's actually the best relationship that, that actually exists in terms of getting family engagement and care and engagement in the process. So the proposals here for me uh, seem to me to be wising up the system, in a sense, in response to what the patients say and also what the named persons say, that there's much more buying into it. However, uh, I mean, I would not want to say uh, that, that the named person does not have an absolute critical role in this because the named persons are often people who will stand up for the patient in a way who, when, when they're at most critical and most vulnerable stage it, it, with, with a context that, that, that actually helps the whole tribunal process understand where to go next. Um, so, so it is important, the name person's role is important, but it's also important to get the right person um, and, and also to get the relationship right between the patient and the name person so that in fact it isn't compromising ongoing activity as well. I mean, I suppose if I go back and I, and I apologize, I, mean, I do make no apology for actually talking personally because I think it often puts the points through. I, I still have information in my head about my mother I just wish I had never been given by the doctors. You know, and, and that wouldn't have meant I would have cared for her any less or responded as her principal carer any less. And I think it actually changed the relationship. And therefore, I think that's why we need to look very carefully and sensitively about the interplay between patients and named persons. Can I Rhoda, of course. Um, my understanding is that the Act allows um, a more proactive approach, but if someone hasn't taken that proactive approach, it goes back to the 2003 regulations, which goes back to, yeah. to the case in point. Do we maybe need to find a different way than reverting back if someone hasn't actually expressly said they don't want to name a person or indeed have named a person. So we maybe need to look back at the role of um, family and carers so that they have input, but maybe not the level of information that you describe, um, so that you're protecting someone's privacy but also allowing kind of someone's nearest and dearest to actually express a view and, and maybe you know, um, not represent that person, but maybe represent what would be in the best interests of that person. This is the bit I, get, I find hard, because obviously I'm here in a judicial capacity, not in a kind of general uh, policy capacity, but I think that, in fact, the outcomes judicially uh, are absolutely more positive for a patient when the family is engaged. And I think that we need to seek to get proper ways of actually doing that. Um, I was recently... Um, dealing with a hearing not far from here in, involving a, a, a patient whose mother, if she wasn't there and put in the input, we would have missed very significant points, uh, both for the patient and actually for the tribunal too, in terms of its decision making. So, I mean, I think there is merit in actually getting this right and, and having a look at how families are involved. And certainly the engagement of families in the overall care and treatment of a patient uh, as a matter of principle for me it is, is solid. Uh, it doesn't always work, and we all know complexities of families, but, but it is a solid principle to work on and has good outcomes, both judicially uh, and, I think, in general terms for a patient in the long term. Uh, no, I mean, I think I would just generally agree with what uh, Ms Grant has suggested, that, that the named person role isn't quite right to do what it is that we need to do, but we do need to find a way both to make sure that people's insight and knowledge of the person uh, is as it brought to before the tribunal where that's appropriate and also where they can sometimes um, if the person you know if you're talking about a person with 
you know, profound depression or, or you know, a florid uh, psychosis really isn't able to say, well, I want to exercise certain rights. Um, sometimes it might be appropriate for uh, a carer to be able to do that. I mean, I know there are provisions in the legislation for a curator ad litem to be appointed where a person can't um, instruct legal representation, for example, but you can only have a curator once the process has already begun. Okay. So, you know, you, 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 if, if there was an issue of somebody else wanted to actually say on behalf of the patient, I want to challenge that order, it's difficult for that to be done. So I think that that's the balance we need to strike, is allowing those things to happen so that the nearest and dearest can can have a say, particularly where the person can't make those decisions for themselves, but as they, without all the baggage that goes with an in-person. Um, uh, Colin Keir's got a supplementary on the name person. I mean, uh, and, uh, and if anyone else has uh, and around that theme, then I'll, I'll take the, those before moving on. Colin. Okay, thank you, convener. Um, I have every sympathy with uh, your view on the name person aspect, um, uh, although not in terms of a tribunal. I've been there myself, and right. it can be torturous in, uh, in parts. Uh, so, you know, thank you for bringing forward your own um, uh, experience because it, it did sort of ring a few bells for me about 15, 16 years ago. Um, really the difficulty, and I think you probably mentioned most of the difficulties, is the, particularly for those members of the family who, or member of the family who has been a named person, doesn't necessarily want to go into the, the difficulties in uh, understanding the problems of whatever part of mental health it is, sake of argument, a hereditary thing that maybe they're blocking off their own um, dif po possible future difficulties, shall I put it that way. Um, and it's really just a case of at what point, when there are responsibilities as the name person, does somebody have to sort of come back and say, well, actually, this is not right for... Uh, the person you're caring for, but there's a no ex non-acceptance, shall we say. And how do we get through that in such a sympathetic manner that it doesn't look as if it's the system overwhelming the uh, the person who's the named carer and, of course, the person we're dealing with ourselves? I mean, a quick response to that, and I don't, and it's a long, complicated set of relationships that you're, you're describing there. Uh, there's often very good, positive work done between the professionals prior to a hearing, and often these things are brought out at, prior to a hearing, and so the MHO and the, the, the responsible medical officer will raise these issues in, in a very, high, very sensitive and appropriate way to try to to kind of nurse the situation forward. Uh, the other thing is that. Um, while we are a judicial body, um, you know, the, the, you know, my thrust has been to make it really as, as kind of sensitive a, a process as possible. So often these things are, 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 are aired at a hearing. So people will talk about the difficulties of, of, of actually being the named person and when it's appropriate and when it's not appropriate. Uh, and then the final thing to say is that we do have a, 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 a very rarely but sometimes used uh, mechanism of, of revoking the named person because it's because it's got become entrenched and it's obviously the professionals have taken a view that it's not um, it's not in the best interests of the the patient uh, and they are always hard because it because it's very rarely that any carer would have a, a, a other than focus on what they thought was the best interests uh, of the patient. So there's a whole number of things that, that go on. But in practice, I'm not aware of too many difficulties in this area. And as I say, we do 3,500 hearings a year. So I'm not, not actually um, aware of many difficulties. And a lot of it's because of the highly professional input that's put an early stage. Uh, the other thing I should talk about in terms of affirming is the excellent work that the advocacy services do in Scotland. Underrated. Um, um, and certainly they do a lot of relationship work and one, uh, undervalued, sorry, and not underrated. I think I rate them very high, but undervalued because they do a lot of um, that, that kind of stuff that you're talking about, running between two parties to assist the communication to take place. And so there's a whole lot of bits of the system that, that actually help it not come into a conflict. 
Yeah, I mean, just, just very briefly, I think a lot of this is to do with the quality of the, the communication and interaction before the, the, the hearing, and, and so some of it's about the mental health officers and the other professionals having the time and space to have a proper engagement with the family rather than just, as I say, serving papers being served on them. And, and I would endorse what Dr Morris says about advocacy, I and mean, coming back to one of the other themes about the 2003 Act, that advocacy is a crucial safeguard there in terms of facilitating that conversation about, you know, do you want your your spouse or your parent or whatever to be your name person? That's a difficult thing to make and you need somebody to um, to help you make that and help you once you've come to a view, make sure that that, that view is, is heard. So the importance of ensuring that advocacy is actually available, I think, is crucial. And, and I would include in that advocacy for carers as well because often they will require help because, and as says, they may Sometimes the service user may know the system better than, than, than the family will. This may be a completely new and bewildering world for them. So I think carers' advocacy is a very important part of the mix too. Richard? Can I just be clear? Does the tribunal have the right, in the event of a named person not being appointed, uh, to require the appointment of an advocate? Well, we don't have the right to do that, but in most cases, the patient has the right to have an advocate, and we would suggest that that was the route to go down. And in practice? In practice, the advocate's often appointed, or, or, or someone else is appointed. The, what, what, I, I don't, I know, I'll, and I've got my eye on the, the clock, but we've also got to be conscious that we don't have so many layers of representation for the patient that the patient gets smothered underneath this, because the a, MHO has an independent role for the patient. The RMO has a, an independent role and caring role. The patient can have a solicitor. The patient can have an advocate. The patient has a named person. The named person can have a, a, an advocate or a solicitor. Uh, and you've just to be, you've obviously to, I mean, um, uh, the, the, the trick for the tribunal is to provide all the protections required to do our task, but not to not to kind of um, smother the patient's voice in this layer upon layer. So it's one of the options that can assist the patient. I'm concerned that you know, the decision has now been made that the person has a right to say, I don't want a named person at all, and that's not going to be overruled. But in those circumstances, can they try, you know, under the new proposal, would the tribunal have the right to say, beyond suggesting an advocate, would they have the right to say, in this particular case, you know, it really is critical that we have an advocate? As I, you want that power? as I understand the, the, the law at present, um, no, we don't have that power. Do I want to? I haven't thought about it, uh, but I think there'll be a, there'll be a lot of um, a lot of implications to that, including resource and availability, and um, a variety of things that, that I would need. If committee want me to address that, I mean, I could give you a response in seven days to my thoughts on that, and I would and I would take on board to. It wouldn't be a response that would necessarily be about the administrative justice, but I would take a board to, to negotiate with um, Colin on that. But I've never thought of that particular issue. If that's your, your if you want that. Be helpful. Thank okay. You. Thank you. I'll take a board to write, write there. And negotiate with Colin on that. And we'll do, probably do a joint thing. I don't think yeah. it'll be too difficult. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, we've got another couple of questions. A A Aileen McLeod, please. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, Section 21 uh, of the bill, I mean, it deals with registering uh, advanced statements and also places a duty on the Commission to maintain a central register of advanced statements. Now, most of the written evidence that the committee um, received were supportive of these provisions, but there were um, some concerns were, re were raised regarding um, privacy uh, with this register, and obviously, you know, advanced statements can contain. Uh, highly personal uh, information that's, that's often rooted in, you know, in very traumatic uh, experiences. So I just would be interested uh, in your views, um, Mr. Mackay, exactly of how the Commission, how you think, um, how you consider that the Commission can ensure that privacy um, will be maintained. I mean, I know that we've, um, you know, Sam H, has, for example, has proposed that the Commission register. Um, you know, they simply um, they should simply note that a specific care person has made an advanced statement that the date it was last updated, and where it's kept, because obviously that would requ that wouldn't require the disclosure of, of highly personal information to people that are not directly involved in a in a person's care. 
I mean, I, I think we'd be quite happy to look at whatever system would, would provide reassurance to uh, service users. I mean, I, I mean, first of all, I, I, I can give a general reassurance that I mean, the Commission already holds very sensitive information about um, patients because we get notification of every single episode of detention, emergency, short term, or, or CTOs, and you know we, we see all the reports. So, so we hold all that data and we, and we keep it securely. There's obviously an issue within the bill about who has the right then to see it. Um, and there's obviously a balance to be struck here because if the advance statement is to be effective, some people have to know it's there and they have to be able to find out what it says so that they can actually um, pay attention to what it says. So I think we'd have to have a system which ensures that if um, uh, a doctor, for example, is having to decide on you know, a, a difficult treatment like ECT or depot medication or whatever, um, and they understand that an advanced statement is in place, that they can easily find out what the person has said in that advanced statement and can give due, due weight to that. So I think that's the balance that we would need to strike. But I, I'm, I'd be very happy to look at how we can do that in a way which ensures that, as the people have confidence in the system. I think the broader point about advanced statements is that, of itself, I can't see this particular provision welcome though it is as being transformational. The real issue is looking at why do people not make advanced statements now and often they don't make advanced statements because they don't understand what an advanced statement is or they don't believe it's going to be effective and I think there's quite a lot of evidence of, of that and I think I would go back to what McManus said that you really need a concerted effort to um, and understand why people would feel reluctant to make an advanced statement and understand what what might help them to make a bit, you know, to think it's worthwhile and help them make a statement that's, that's actually effective. Um, I know that there is work, the Scottish Recovery Network and others are doing work with service users and evangelising in some areas about advanced statements, and that has had uh, has had an impact. I mean, one of the other things that we do is we look at how often an advanced statement is overridden, um, and it would be quite interesting, I think, to try and join that up and say. Um, what, what is it you know, that would help you draft an effective advance statement? When is it if you say something, you, you probably aren't, you are wasting your time because that's never going to be upheld because it's perhaps just a, not a practical thing to say. Where might there be circumstances where you can actually have an effective say? So I think there's a lot more work needs to be done with, um, uh, with service users to, as I say, to understand the barriers and to actually help them make this uh, worthwhile. But, but I say, in relation to the privacy point, we'd be very happy to look at what, whatever reassurances we can offer on that. Um, thank you very much, Ms. McKay. That's uh, very helpful. And, and obviously, my follow-up question actually was around some of the barriers um, to completing advanced statements, and you know, maybe looking at some of the, the training that might be available to help um, people, you know, sort of draw up advanced statements, and, and also for witnesses uh, as well. Yeah, we have to recognise often that, that one of the barriers is people do feel generally quite disempowered in the system, so they don't yet feel that this is actually going to be a worthwhile tool for them because they just think, if I'm ill, this decision is going to be taken for me anyway, so what's the point? And it's that kind of um, uh, at, you know, thing that we need to change. We need to change the, um, the sense of disempowerment and use this as a tool which people do think is actually a way of getting some of what I want in, as, as part of a dialogue with the professionals that, that are involved in my care. Okay, thank you. Dr Murray, do you want to add? add no? no, I don't want no. to make any response to that, that's but fine. that's okay. Can I ask a quick supplementary on that? On that one, yeah. The, the new Act re removes the notification to the Mental Welfare Commission of short-term orders. Is that not going to be a disconnect with the register? If you're not informed about an STO, then then how are you going to actually let them know that there is an advanced statement on the register? Or is the register going to be published? Because, again, that would be confidential. I, I, th I think it's the notification of emergency detentions that's being removed. Uh, I, I, I think so. And I think, I think we suggested that because often it was really just a kind of phone call left on our answering yes. machine in the middle of the night. So it, it felt like it wasn't anything we were able to do anything about. But we, we do get to hear about orders as, as they come in. Um, but, but I mean, it's important also to say that, that if advanced statements are made, the, the local services are also made aware of it uh, um, so that they can operate without having to check in with us. Um. Okay. Is that supplementary to this? I'll come around. Bob's one um, Gil Patterson, please. Yeah, thanks so much, Convener. Uh, can I raise with you uh, the issue of uh, Section 15? 
And I know that I uh, listened to Colin Mackay and his uh, introductory statement that you said uh, that patients' rights when it came to this bill uh, in some regards had been contracted. And of course, uh, with the power of transfer of patients from one hospital to another, the proposal is to reduce that uh, from 12 uh, weeks to four weeks which is quite a substantial uh, number, uh, or a substantial differential. However, it, it would seem that what the bill is trying to achieve here is provide uh, medical care uh, for the patient uh, themselves. So I wonder what your views were uh, in, in regard to and comment on that aspect of the bill. Yeah, again, it's, it's, it's a very difficult balancing act, and we, we entirely understand the point that um, if a person requires to be in the state hospital, genuinely requires to be in the state hospital, that means that there um, are significant uh, risks involved in the care and treatment, and there are particular things that the state hospital can do which can't be safely done uh, in local services. So uh, it is not good for a person who does need that level of care and security to be uh, deny that, even though they may not want it, um, for long periods of time. So, so we, we entirely get that. But I think um, against that, you do have to recognise that somebody who's ill enough to need to be in the state hospital or need to be transferred into the state hospital from another hospital is pretty ill, and, and expecting them to um, uh, in, negotiate with their lawyer, engage with the lawyer, and, and prepare an appeal within that 28-day period seems... Uh, a bit heroic to us and I think uh, I know there's a, a, a suggestion that well, you just need to lodge in some sort of appeal so I don't want to be there and that will kind of meet the time scales but I, I, I don't think that's really the uh, appropriate way to, to go I mean, we've suggested that as can already happen in, in emergency cases that it might be that well I think two things we'd say perhaps there's a meeting in the middle between you know um, uh, the, the very large cut to 28 days from 12 weeks to 28 days, there may be some kind of middle period, or it may be that um, uh, there's some provision, particularly, I suppose, that the place, if a patient is transferred before an appeal is determined, which I think if they need the care, that ought to be possible, that there needs to be a guarantee that the place will be held, the, the place they came from will be held until that appeal is determined. Because I think the... The worst case scenario for us is patients transferred to the state hospital, appeal successfully, and then it's well, I'm sorry, you've lost the bed that you came from. And so that's, I think, so I think we would be in favour of provisions that allow early transfer where that is needed, but ensuring that the patient's right to go back where they came from should they win an appeal is, is upheld. So I'm gathering that you're not against the principle in itself that a time span should be restricted for the good of the patient, it's the mechanisms in between that, yeah. that we need to guard against. Uh, uh, and so that if the bill could be, you know, uh, if it could be put into legislation that what you would be effectively asking, the individual's rights would be, you know, not exceeded to, that they would, for a time they would lose their right because it would be placed uh, against their wishes effectively, I think, since they would have already said that they're against this move. So, but it would only be temporary until some, it might even be not, not in regards to the mental situation, it might be some other ailment that's required uh, to be treated. And so therefore that might exacerbate the mental condition. So yeah. that you're, you're saying that there may be some middle ground. Well, well, yeah, I mean, I think, in relation to the appeals to um, the state hospital, I think it would normally be in relation to people's mental condition. It would be that their, um, be, you know, their, their risk level had, had increased or their, their degree of concern about their mental health had, had increased. So I think those would be the cases that, that would be, uh, we'd be talking about. But I, I think the, the balance is to allow the person to move quickly to an appropriate care regime where there is evidence that they really need to be in a different place but to maintain the appeal right for long enough that there's a reasonable chance the patient will be able to effectively exercise it. And, and I think our concern is that 28 days isn't really long enough um, for all circumstances at the moment.
Uh, uh, have you any idea of what the more uh, suitable figure in, in, in regards to your own opinion is rather than the four week? I, I, I don't know if there's any kind of scientific uh, figure. I mean, I'd say going down from 12 weeks forward just seems a bit kind of drastic to us. And as it may be as much about maintaining the um, ability to. Um, uh, appeal after the patient has gone to state. The other point about that, I suppose, is the patient may not know um, what it's like until they, they get there. Now, obviously, they will have a right to appeal eventually around um, uh, a placement in the state, but, uh, you know, I mean, if it's, you know, six weeks is better than four, but I'm, uh, I would say, but I'm not saying that's a particularly scientific um, figure. Well, I suppose I should ask the next question then. Is, is, there, a, is there evidence what the normal time takes if there is such a thing, could that give us guidance by, uh, in some way, to, to look at the substantial? I, I, mean, I think this is very important questioning because I think it relates to the to the rights that the patient have has, uh, and I just I just want to preface it by saying a few things. That, that one is that the patient's rights are are almost already uh, compromised because the patient is an is is a, is a inv you know, they're, they're con compulsionary treated and detained in hospital at that time. Uh, and the basis that with the state does that is because it, because it provides care and treatment. So uh, while, it, while it is a kind of further and for, 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 you know, kind of look at rights, the situation is that the, the state has decided through this legislation that this patient should be detained uh, for care and treatment. The, the, the second thing uh, um, to say is that the cases that I know that move to the state hospital uh, that, 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 I, that I've dealt with when it comes to an appeal against the transfer are often highly complex with high risk factors. Uh, and that's where, that's where my instinct would like to tell you three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, six weeks, because that gives us a, a boundary. But while, we, while we've got to this complex care um, need to transfer, it's often individual to the patient. So that would be my experience. So therefore, it's hard to give a kind of um, a framework in, in, in the way that, that, that you, you're looking for, which I think it would, would be helpful if we could do it. But I'm, I'm not sure that, 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 that we can do it. But the other thing that, that I can say to you, that bearing in mind that the, that the rights are suspended because the person has been treated anyway against their will, that the move is because of very complex um, <coughs> um, reasons. When it comes to the, any form of appeal, we deal with that as, very, as a priority. Uh, so it's a priority, and we have a, and in many cases I will deal with those appeals myself, and it's uh, to kind of redress the balance that you that you're trying to to explore with the committee that the judicial process is the protection for the patient and also for the for the state's intervention at that stage, um, but but it is a highly complex, uh, and I don't and, I, and I, I'm sure you can all it's because it's so individualistic in many cases that it's that it becomes complex. It's about the patient themselves and where they are. Yeah, no, just to add to that, I mean, it, it's about as the, the ability of the local services to, to meet their needs, and, and that uh, will be a complex issue, and it's about a balance around, sometimes it's actually not about the the person, it's actually about the quality and, yeah. and range of uh, local services, and we particularly find that sometimes with people with learning disabilities who might have very complex uh, needs, um, where actually the in an ideal world, they wouldn't be in the state hospital, but it may be that just the kind of services that they need locally are just just not available. And in, and in a case like that, I think it is very important that um, the judicial system really tests very vigorously, is it actually acceptable to say that because we've had a breakdown in, in this person's placement in a, in a local service, that the state is where hospital is where you're going to have to, to go. So as in those cases, we'll take time to prepare and, and, and to argue out. Um, so as the, 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 the fallback for us is that the person needs to be able to go back where they came from if that's what um, the judicial determination is at whatever time that is made. Without putting words in your mouth, you're actually sympathetic to it as long as the rights are guarded after the fact. Yes, I think that's 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 right. Yeah. Right, thanks very much for that. Thank you. Minette Mellon. 
I'd like to return briefly um, to the issue of ac right of access to independent advocacy, which you both stressed is, is a very important right. And I understand that that's not consistently available um, across the country. Now, I know Sam H have, have said to me that, that they are very concerned there's nothing about that in the actual proposed uh, bill, um, although the government don't think that legislation is necessary uh, on this count. What are your views on that? Do you think there should be something in, in legislation, or do you think it can be sorted by by other means? Uh, I, th I think one. Of, I, well, I think first of all, I would agree that the evidence from the um, the surveys that the Scottish Independent Advocacy Alliance um, undertake, for example, is that the availability of advocacy is patchy. By and large, I think if you are um, enmeshed in you know, detention proceedings, you and, and you seek an advocate, you'll get one. But um, the duty in the 2003 Act was deliberately not saying you shall have an advocate if you're subject to a CTO application, because the whole point is that advocacy could help you negotiate a care package which, is, which might make compulsion unnecessary. So it's vital that advocacy is available to people before the things are broken down to the extent that... that the professionals are saying, we cannot get you to agree to treatment, therefore we're going to have to force treatment on you. So that was very much what Millen wanted, and that's what I think the 2003 Act set out to deliver. And in a way, it's, it's quite hard to strengthen the duty because the duty is already very strong in the Act. I think, for me, the answer is around the accountability for that duty, and, and perhaps there needs to be more, um, whether it's for the legislation, there may be the possibility of some kind of statement in the legislation or whether it's for the government to commit to um, proper auditing of the availability and, and the performance of local authorities and health services, for example. Now, the, the, you know, local authorities are assessed by the care inspectorate in terms of the fulfilment of the statutory duties. I'm not sure whether or not the discharge of the duties and advocacy has ever been something that's, that's been looked at. Um, so I think it's something about building in a better accountability mechanism, whether that's through the Commission or through the Care Inspectorate or, or other means to ensure that where people want advocacy at whatever sort of stage in the process they're at, uh, they, they can get it, because I think there is evidence at the moment that that's not universally the case. So I think it's more that than, in a sense, trying to strengthen a duty which is already pretty strong. Uh, we have... Um good experiences of, of fairly active advocates on many of our cases so and but I recognize that, that you know that we're at the, the what's often the kind of hard end decision making bit uh, and that's not where they're where they're always needed but but it certainly are needed there uh, and so we, we have pretty good coverage for tribunals uh, and and why I why I think it's significant is because the principal role that the advocate carries out is one of facilitating communication and, and it's communication from the patients to the other professionals, to the named person, to the tribunal. So it's a very significant role indeed. Uh, and one of the, 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 the things I initiated very early on with the independent advocacy organisation was, uh, was a writing a guidelines uh, for, for, for advocates appearing in the mental health tribunal. And everyone's agreed that that's what we should do. And that gives us an element of accountability of practice within the mental health tri tribunal. But, but I think you need to take into account Colin's comments uh, really about the coverage, about negotiating care packages, about negotiating things outside the, 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 tri the tribunal. Uh, but, but good experience from them. If you ever have the time to speak to some of the users of service, which I'm sure you do, and ask them about the, the function of advocates, um, they, they, are, they, they, are, they talk very highly uh, about the, the provision of the support that they are given and there's a, 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 you know, a, a, a very good book I would recommend to you by a lady called Jo McFarlane called Skydiving for Beginners and it has a chapter on her experience of, um, um, of advocacy in terms of how it supported her through a particular period. To the point, I think you could all benefit from it. I'd be happy to put the money up to buy your copies <laughs> because I really think it, you get it from, the, from independent advocacy. And if you just tell it, put it on my account because I think it's really well worth reading if you're dealing with this bill uh, for a variety of reasons. But the section on advocacy, is, I would highly I would, I would commend to you. 
point that there is a question of equity as well yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. That, Depending that's, on where you are, what advocate you yeah. get, and you know, and and audit and measurement of yeah. of what is available. And, and how freely available it is and what quality it is uh, is, yeah. is very, very important. I'm yeah. sure you would agree. Yeah. Thank you. Very helpful. Thanks, thanks for that. I think we, we've, we've concluded our general questions, though, but I'm aware that there, there, are, there are some additional questions from Richard Lyle. I think Bob wants to ask questions. Are there, are there any others? Or are those just two final questions? Richard Lyle, please. Thank you, Karina. Just as we are getting near the, ev the end of the evidence session, I'm quite happy to read the book, but I don't want to go skydiving. Um, I'll, I'll quite happily. Um, but basically, can I ask you, are there any other issues you would like to see addressed in this bill? Actually, it's actually covered what it can at this particular stage, and I think it's... Um, I have expressed the view... Uh, at least in writing to my own members, that it will not be long before we will need to look at an overall an overall look at the whole mental health legislation. But at this stage, this this is something that that's, that that in fact I think addresses where we are in the progress of mental health legislation. Mr. Mackay, have you any? Uh, well, I think I, I would generally agree with that. I think I would also reinforce the point, though, that that I say this is this is a, a useful um, tidying up exercise. But actually, I think particularly the interface with um, incapacity legislation and adult support and protection legislation does need address. The, the Law Commission, I understand we're reporting tomorrow about um, the problems of um, uh, people being deprived of their liberty by being placed in care homes uh, or in other kind of care settings where they're not able to agree or disagree. Um, and, and that's going to be another strain on, on the system. Um, I think my general sense is that the, the 2003 Act um, say, and, and the Adults with Incapacity Act were world-leading pieces of legislation. I think for their time, uh, I think they did genuinely lead the world. Uh, I think there is a danger, though, that unless we start thinking about the next wave, particularly around supported decision-making, I think they have a fantastic framework for where you have to take decisions away from people and make them, other people make them. I think they have a good framework for that. What we really need to be moving towards is how do we help support people, uh, and advocacy is part of it, and advanced statements are part of it, but how do we think through how you actually empower and support people to maximise their choice and control in the system um, so that the use of the, the Mental Health Act is, remains the exception rather than the rule? That's, I think, not so much for this bill, but something which I, I would urge parliamentarians to kind of um, consider um, in their future plans. Thank you, Kizia. Oh, uh, I think um, the earlier points was going to raise been addressed by some of my colleagues. That's fine, thank you. Okay, thanks for that, and thank you both for uh, your, your time with us this morning and uh, your valu valuable evidence. And uh, I'm sure we'll see it reflected in our final reports. Thank you both very much for your time with us this morning. Thank, thank you. you very much, Mr. Dean, and members, and I wish you all the well with your work. Thank you. Thank you. We. Suspend momentarily at this point. Oh, yeah, we're going, we've, as we're previously agreed, we've got them in that, we're going into private session now anyway, so it's a, a run to the toilet, a run for the coffee, a run for the...